Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Julian Chun, Frankfurt, Germany, and I'm very glad to welcome you to this webinar, which is discussing advancement in persistent AF ablation, and we will discuss new clinical evidence and techniques. And I am very happy and proud that um, together with me, um, as an in international um, expertise uh, with Dr. Asmundis and Dr. Schilling, and uh, we will yeah, go into details about all well, questions regarding persistent atrial fibrillation. So I will hand over now for the first time to Dr. Asmundis to introduce himself. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm very glad to be here with you guys. And uh, uh, let's introduce myself. I come from Brussels. Uh, I work in University Hospital of Brussels. Um, uh, we are uh, running a, a training program for an international fellow, and uh, we are, since the last 10 years, uh, very busy to, um, to do research about atrial fibrillation and specific on atrial fibrillation ablation. Uh, I will be this evening here to present you some uh, development of the guideline uh, about persistent atrial fibrillation. Richard? Great. Well, my name is Richard Schilling. Um, I have been doing AF ablation since 1999, so I've been lucky to be involved in it from the very beginning. I started my training in Hull in the northeast of England and then moved to St. Mary's in London. And now I'm based at Bart's Heart Centre, which is one of the biggest cardiovascular centres in the UK and one of the biggest in Europe. And we do about a thousand AF ablations a year, and this is growing steadily year on year and I personally do about two to 300 AF ablations a year. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to being involved in this presentation and I'm really looking forward to hearing the questions from the audience. Yeah, great. So you see we have a great international uh, panel with experts on arrhythmias and um, therefore I think we should have a quick look maybe onto the agenda, what to <coughs> expect today. And you see that we will have two presentations one held by Dr. Asmundis and one held by Dr. Schilling. I just see that some questions uh, which we were asking uh, initially are coming, the data is coming in. Um, so the question was, what is not meeting the current definition of persistent atrial fibrillation? And 20% of you said, A, more than seven days continuous atrial fibrillation, cardioversion of AF within seven days, cardioversion of AFib more than seven days, 80%. Okay, but I think we will learn more about uh, the current definitions of uh, persistent atrial fibrillation, and I'm happy that um, Carlos will start with his first presentation. One again, uh, everybody knows that uh, atrial fibrillation is uh, uh, increasing more and more, um, also of the fact that the population in Europe is aging. Um, the point is that it's expected to be uh, predicted in 2060. Um, that when today are 10 million, uh, it will be the double in 2060. So uh, for sure we have to uh, take care of these disease because we will not be classified as a rare disease. And what we know also that uh, uh, when you have a patient or when you have Three a paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, uh, in, um, in the overall rate of in developing persistent atrial fibrillation is 5.5% per year. So that means that when you have atrial fibrillation, it can only progress, and it can only progress in the direction of the uh, persistent. And when you have a persistent atrial fibrillation, actually what we saw, the atrial fibrillation promote a fibrosis process that uh, it could be uh, sometimes irreversible. But anyway, it promotes a fibrosis process all over around the uh, atrium. And then you can see in this graphic what is the uh, region that they have the most um, fibrotic uh, process, even after uh, up to uh, five weeks of continuous atrial fibrillation. Now, uh, as, uh, as you can see in this study, it was tried to get uh, an... Uh, uh, stage of left atrium based on the per, on the um, on the atrial fibrillation. As you can see, it was a classified four stage based on the uh, level of fibrosis, fibrosis. And then you can see on the uh, bottom part of the um, left atrium, you can see how the uh, massive fibrosis process is uh, in the stage four uh, on the persistent of a fib. Um, but uh, on the other hand, we know that uh, Hurley's is the treatment. Hurley's uh, is better. I mean, if we can treat the patient as soon as possible when uh, the um, atrial fibrillation occurs, then we have the better follow-up of our patient. Um, now, the, the guideline also in 2016, they have to challenge on the fact that the uh, classification of atrial fibrillation, it doesn't fit really our uh, electrophysiological job. 
But does it mean that uh, um, the first challenge in 2016 was clarify what is the uh, persistent data fibrillation? In fact, uh, uh, the, the committee decided to uh, specify that uh, uh, episode of uh, cardioverted in, inside the uh, seven days was still considered an paroxysm atrial fibrillation. That's open a, a big chapter because uh, uh, it make a kind of cutoff to, to decide what is the persistent, what is the paroxysm atrial fibrillation. Uh, there still remain um, a, a challenge to, to uh, select your patient for the ablation. But anyway, the guideline 2016, they allow you to treat this patient with a persistent atrial fibrillation with an ablation. And what most important for this ablation that they suggest that as a first approach on the persistent atrial fibrillation, a PVI should be considered as a first line treatment. So there are no study justify an uh, um, uh, extra line, seem justify extra line on the first procedure in patient with a persistent atrial fibrillation. Now, uh, nevertheless, the study that everybody knows probably published on the New England in 2016, uh, 15, sorry, it was uh, uh, showing that the STEREF2 that anyway, uh, less may be more. What does it mean that uh, uh, they showed that finally the PVI was the, uh, the patient they performed only the PVI was the best outcome, or anyway, uh, PVI was the uh, procedure that can give uh, the best outcome uh, of uh, this patient, and uh, at, the, at the line, it doesn't show any uh, extra advantage. Uh, what I want to show also that uh, in this study of 2016 on a, a heart treatment, uh, we saw that the uh, predominant place where you can find a, a trigger on the AFib, they are still on the uh, PVI, so the, uh, the pulmonary vein, sorry. The pulmonary vein remains still the first target on all three categories of atrial fibrillation. That means that uh, um, the, the design of the best treatment of a persistent atrial fibrillation should be on the multiple sequence procedure. So the first procedure should be target a uh, PVI of the pulmonary vein, Eventually, on the recurrence of the second procedure, should be considered re-isolate the vein where they are reconnected, of uh, complete uh, with uh, additional line. Additional line is at the moment is open on the experience of the center, on the experience of the physician. On the third procedure only, you should consider to add uh, extra line. Now, in our experience, actually, we uh, we analyze the use of cryoballoon uh, cryo advanced second generation in a persistent fibrillation. I will show you uh, three studies we recently published about that on the one-year follow-up, and all of these studies, they show that, uh, uh, for example, in this study, we, we uh, make comparison between uh, uh, cryoablation and radiofrequency ablation in two uh, small court, and we saw that in the percentage of the fibrillation, the outcome was almost the same. So it means that in a stable um, PVI isolation with the consistent isolation of the pulmonary vein, could be uh, an improvement on the long-term uh, follow-up of the patient. In this study, we show actually that uh, if the patient recurrence in the blanking period with uh, atrial tachyarrhythmias has a, a high um, risk to recurrence on the long-term, again, of uh, atrial fibrillation. So again, here we are uh, with the first line of PVI ablation, we are subselect the patient that they can show from the beginning that PVI will not probably be enough. But at least in, uh, in the second study, we show that actually this, uh, up to, uh, again, here we have a one uh, year follow-up on, uh, on the court of patient that was treated with a cryo balloon uh, advanced in atrial fibrillation. We show that in the, um, this is the uh, capra major with, uh, with uh, without blanking period. The point is that uh, uh, the, um, the only uh, parameter that could predict the success of the ablation uh, was uh, the uh, dimension of the left atrium and, of course, the recurrence of atrial tachyarrhythmias during a planking period. But that's what I want to show you, that uh, anyway, uh, the one-year follow-up was on the 60% uh, of patients freed of uh, uh, AFib uh, after one year of the uh, index procedure of cryoballoon ablation. Um, the blanking period could be uh, significant when you have a recurrence during blanking period uh, to predict whether the patient will recur on the long term. Carlo, let me Please. interrupt you for one second because we have the first sets of uh, questions or answers coming back from the audience. And the question was, which ablation strategy do you use for the index procedure to treat patients with persistent atrial fibrillation? A, PVI only 75%, PVI plus lines 25%, all the other options 0%. So, no, actually, what do you think about it? I'm glad to see that uh, there are no many people uh, proposal extra line. Uh, 
We do perform uh, PVI isolation as a first line uh, procedure in persistent atrial fibrillation. And uh, we believe uh, in our experience that uh, a single shot procedure with a cryo balloon advance is the best option uh, to isolate and as a stable lesion in this vein. But this is our approach. Uh, we do not perform as a first line in this procedure extra line. I don't know what is your experience. What would you do if you switched over atrial fibrillation into atrial tachycardia during the procedure? <laughs> This is a very nice question. Of course, uh, uh, you can be solved using cryo balloon actually, because uh, the chance that we could see uh, we could be challenged with an atrial tachycardia was not so high during a cryo balloon ablation. So uh, actually, if we, there is an um, atrial tachycardia, of course, we go for it. But uh, honestly, um, the possibility of the patient that during the cryo balloon ablation they develop an atrial tachycardia was not stopped during the during the isolation of the vein. It's uh, very uh, rare. All right. Okay. Is that matching your experience? Too, I agree. I think, I think it is very rare that yeah. you, you know, it evolves from persistent AF to ATAC just with a cryo balloon ablation. I agree with you, Tom. All right. So I think we move on then, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, this is the last study. Uh, it's a recent study about, again, a, a repeat procedure uh, of uh, um, actually the, we went to see after one year on the patient that the recurrence of uh, uh, when they get the first procedure with the cryo balloon advance. And uh, in this population, uh, um, there was a uh, uh, 15 uh, patient that didn't recur, and the uh, five patient that recurrence. Uh, these are the uh, characteristic of the population. Uh, they are the uh, region of the uh, vein where the recurrence, and that actually in the patient uh, um, 15, uh, um, they have still AFib. They was a reconnected vein, and they we, we went again for uh, uh, consolidate the uh, PVI uh, isolation. So what uh, uh, the study show actually that uh, in, um, in the repeat procedure follow-up uh, uh, with uh, a cryo balloon advance, uh, the procedure was very short to re-isolate the vein. 75% of the patients were free of AFib and, uh, 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 after one year. And uh, we noted that 60% uh, of the patient the recurrence was due to a new onset atrial fibrillation. It was not due on uh, structural uh, arrhythmias like was uh, uh, that means that in the past we, we remember that we have a lot of left flutter or very complex procedure that they take a long time uh, to get treated to the uh, specific mapping. Now, just to uh, summarize our strategy, uh, because uh, uh, we consider cryo balloon a simplified technique, then uh, uh, we simplify also our approach. We, we are still doubting about the uh, classification of paroxysmal, persistent, and uh, uh, permanent. But uh, anyway, we treat the patient uh, based on the anatomical um, approach. So we super uh, analyze the patient and we super uh, select the patient in a, a large atrium or not a large atrium. When it's not a large atrium, we do perform a cryo balloon ablation as a first line to, pro uh, to provide a PVI uh, isolation. When the uh, atrium is, uh, is uh, are large, we do perform an hybrid procedure uh, with concomitant with a cardiosurgeon thoracoscopic and the EP um, uh, procedure from an uh, endovascular side. On the second line, of course, we go for a different mapping. Now, on the second line approach, of course, we have several uh, studies running to see what is the best approach, also because we want to randomize the approach and to see, again, if uh, uh, we can uh, find out what is the best uh, uh, option. Um, now, what I want to say that uh, probably this classification should be reconsidered, and uh, there is this nice quote that is say that uh, uh, the electrical light did not come from the continuous improvement of the candle. So maybe we should uh, reconsider the classification of the fibrillation, or maybe we should make a classification for uh, uh, um, EP uh, people or uh, in consider the ablation. I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, um, before we go into some more details on this, there's the, question, the next set of um, answers coming back uh, regarding the questions what to do now in the repeat procedure. And uh, option number one, A, re-PVI only, 25%. Interesting. Re-PVI plus additional lines, 25%. And uh, question C or option C, re-PVI plus cafe ablation, 50%. Um, so um, some people may uh, argue cafe a day, or uh, maybe, uh, I mean, you did not talk too much about cafe ablation. So no, um, actually. Uh, how, how do you see the role of cafe in the uh, setting? We, we do have a, a one of a, uh, the trial in our center uh, talking about cafe or anyway, this kind of approach. But uh, uh, we doubt. Uh, also uh, about uh, the efficacy, but of course we would like to have uh, some uh, scientific evidence uh, about that. A star F2 uh, uh, showing that uh, uh, added the cafe, it didn't improve the uh, outcome of the procedure. 
What I, I don't understand why the people answer that uh, redo PVI plus line, uh, uh, to me, it doesn't make sense because if you have a reconnection of, uh, um, for example, in the study I show, if you have reconnection of the vein and the patient presents uh, atrial fibrillation, if you re-isolate the vein, probably will be enough. I don't feel that you should add the line at that moment, but of course, every patient should be considered um, as a single case. I don't know what is your opinion about that. Um, I agree um, that this is a very, I mean, this is the key, one of the key questions, I believe, what to do in repeat procedures um, in patients with persistent, maybe also in, in paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Uh, and I think all these given options uh, at least have some theoretical, um, let's say, arguments in fa favoring each individual strategy. But of course, uh, and I think I understand you in this way. Uh, in the first set, we need to make sure that we have a permanent PVI isolation. Absolutely. And uh, we have to think about what to do in patients with permanent uh, PV isolation. Um, and um, I think this is the, the urgent and the burning or the cooling question, <laughs> what to do in the next step. Um, so, I'm, I mean, I think it's interesting. You mentioned surgic surgery also as part of your workflow. And it's also mentioned in the recent guidelines. No, none of the uh, persons in the audience uh, voted for surgical air fibrillation. I think that's interesting. I, I would agree, at least at this, for the second procedure, would be too early for us. Um, the role of left atrial appendage isolation, I mean, there's some data out. Um, but, uh, if I can interrupt you, uh, actually, we published a two years follow up on the hybrid procedure. If we look in, in uh, deep, the, 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 the hybrid procedure actually it perform uh, a uh, uh, denervation and isolation at the posterior box. And, uh, and uh, occlusion of the uh, left appendage, so reduction of the volume of the left atrium. I mean, the, 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 the strategy inside the hybrid procedure are almost all of them together. Uh, we have a very good outcome, and at least we could convert the patient that they didn't be, I mean, in most of the patients, they were free, but uh, the other, they converted in paroxysmal fibrillation, so we could control the sinus rhythm in the long persistent AFib. So for me, it's, it's a successor to regress the disease on the paroxysmal uh, way. Richard, one sh very short comment from your side with regards to cafe ablation and um, maybe also empiric left atrial appendage isolation. Well, I'm, I'm deliberately trying to limit my views because the next 20 minutes I'm just going to be giving nothing but my views. But in terms of left atrial appendage occlusion, uh, the only thing that concerns me about that is we still don't understand the role of the left atrial appendage. And if you're trying to restore sinus rhythm and potentially left atrial mechanical contraction, then perhaps one ought to try and preserve that left atrial appendage if you possibly can, because it may have a very important contractile function. No, I, I believe we do on a research level that. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's not a standard procedure. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thanks for the question, audience. It's great. Uh, it's very interactive. Keep on going. Keep on putting questions. And we move on to the second presentation. And uh, Professor Schilling will present on advanced technologies. Great, so uh, we've all ha already had the scene very nicely set about where we're at at the moment. And what I want to do is to try and give my perspective on where we're at at the moment and where we mo might move to in the future. Uh, these are my disclosures. So Carl has already made the point that at the moment, whatever we do, the, the outcome seems to be the same. And in fact, the less we do, uh, the outcome may be better. So the star F trial has shown that pulmonary vein isolation seems to give better freedom from AF at 19 months than any other strategy. So that then argues the case for using this technology, the cryo balloon, and you can put a balloon into the pulmonary veins, use a pulmonary vein mapping guide wire to then demonstrate isolation when you then apply freezing to the balloon and it creates a ring of frostbitten tissue around the outside of the vein that then disconnects it from the rest of the atria and then hopefully prevents the trigger, which is the pulmonary vein electrogram, getting into the left atrium while leaving the plumbing, the pulmonary vein flow, uninterrupted and unaffected. Now the advantage of this is very clear. Um, these procedures can be done as day cases. Um, they are very quick and very easy to do, and these, these are our experience from our center. We have an outreach hospital where we've been doing this as a day case for just over a year now, and we've had no complications related to day case discharge. Very consistent procedures can be performed, so despite having three different physician operators, we're producing 
mean procedure times with very, very tight standard deviations, uh, a 60-minute procedure with a 1.4-minute standard deviation. It's possible to use very low fluoroscopy, less than uh, six minutes with very low doses, and it produces very highly predictable results. But where do we progress from here? Is this the future for persistent AF forever and a day? So I would argue that STAR AF2 was an extremely important study, but it didn't mean that substrate ablation had no value. What it really meant is that we just don't know how to perform substrate ablation, and we don't know what we should be ablating, because it's clear that persistent AF is a different uh, substrate. It's a different mechanism from paroxysmal AF. So what are the issues for persistent AF ablation? Well, we've had the challenge of being able to produce continuous and persistent lesions that could even just isolate the veins, let alone do lines and CFE. And that's contributed by difficulty in getting catheter stability, particularly in patients who are not under general anesthetic, breathing for themselves. They may be shifting on the table when they're in pain. We've also had challenges in knowing exactly where the catheter is. And the pulmonary vein isolation with cryoablation solves that problem very nicely because you know that the balloon is jammed into the pulmonary vein antrum. We've also had challenges with transmurality and lesion size partly contributed to by catheter contact, but also by tissue thickness. One of the disadvantages of one-size-fits-all technologies is that you're often giving the same amount of energy to the very t thin tissue at the back of the atrium as you are to the very thicker tissue on the anterior aspects of the veins. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we ablate the correct location to identify non-pulmonary vein triggers and perhaps other AF mechanisms that may not be just coming from focal activity in the pulmonary veins. So a number of things have, been, have led to improved catheter stability, not least deflectible sheaths or other robotic and um, manipulation technologies. So this is just one example of the Hansen robotic sheath where you steer a sheath using a joystick outside the room, which then allows you to deliver very precise and stable lesion sets, even if you're using a point-by-point -point ablation strategy. Unfortunately, these sorts of technologies are more expensive, they take longer to use, and it's been very difficult for these types of companies and technologies to gain traction in the wider uh, physician environment. Physicians get very used to doing it a particular way. Another important technology that's made a big difference to us in terms of point-by-point -point ablation is contact force. And there, again, there are a number of solutions to this, all of which um, give us a very good idea of whether the catheter is in contact and how much that contact force is. And this is very important because when you're delivering radiofrequency energy at least, the greater the contact, the bigger the lesion, and therefore you can predict how big the lesion is according to the amount of time you're ablation and the amount of pressure you're giving. However, when you look at the outcomes of contact force and the clinical impact, and this is uh, probably one of the few truly multi-center randomized trials looking at technologies in AF ablation, and this is comparing contact force off to contact force on using exactly the same catheter and localization technology, and you can see that the contact force made no difference to actual clinical outcomes in this multi-center randomized trial. Now, this may be explained by the fact that other technologies have, have, uh, in, uh, have been additional, and I'll explain what I mean by that in just a second. Catheter location has come a long way in AF ablation, I think we'll all agree. This is an example of a geometry being cre created by a pulmonary vein catheter, and you can see the catheter is in the left lower pulmonary vein. The quality of the catheter localization and the stability means that we are now able to do our procedures entirely fluoroscopy free because we know that the catheter, if it's pointing at the back of the left atrium and going out more laterally, must be in the left lower pulmonary vein. If we turn it clockwise and spin it up, it goes into the left upper pulmonary vein. And then if we decide to create a separate geometry, we can then add the rest of the left atrium by adding our main geometric markers first, the pulmonary veins, and this is the right upper pulmonary vein, 
and as we drag back and turn anti-clockwise, we'll sweep back across the left atrium as we try and get in and engage the right lower pulmonary vein. So this makes a big difference, not only to the radiation exposure to the patient and the uh, clinical staff, but also to the accuracy of the lesions we're placing. What this means is that over the last few years, and I'm just showing you my own personal data, is that I now no longer use a lead when I'm doing a persistent AF ablation if I'm using a 3D mapping system because I can predict that I'm not going to use fluoroscopy during that case, particularly if I'm using a general anesthetic because I can do the transeptal puncture with TOE guidance. It also means that our procedure times are dropping because we are able to know that every single lesion that we produce has some clinical benefit in terms of isolating those pulmonary veins. We can hope for the future that further technologies will give us better characterization of the tissue. So here we've got a technology being potentially issued by Biosense Webster looking at microelectrodes to further characterize the effect of the lesion on the um, tissue. However, Richard, let me just uh, inter interrupt you. <laughs> Sorry for no that. No problem. Because we, again, uh, have the answers back from the first question for you. And I uh, just repeat the question again. What tools do you use to treat patients with persistent AF? A, point by point, RF, 12.5%. Point by point, RF with contact, force sensing, 25%. Cry balloon, 62.5%, and D, zero. So um, maybe in line with what you were indicating, also with the initial data you did share. Uh, interestingly, um, yeah, a huge part of the audience is using the cry balloon, interestingly, in persistent AF. And I think that's an experience that's uh, shared by many, if nothing else, simply because of our enormous waiting list. And the only way of being able to offer these patients treatment in a timely manner is to do something that's quick and efficient. So I would say a significant proportion of our patients, their first line treatment is with cryoablation, but that doesn't mean that we are not still exploring, like every other one, every other group, um, ways of improving the first time outcome using other technologies. So I would say about 25% of our patients we use point by point with contact force sensing, with robotic, uh, and maybe some other mapping technology to try and better identify the substrate. And are you um, uh, for, uh, pursuing the endpoint of pulmonary vein isolation or? you do deploy additional lesions depending on the substrate or whatsoever, or is it an individualized approach for you and your institution? So in those developmental patients, we are doing pulmonary vein isolation as our absolute foundation, and then making attempts to understand the mechanism and customizing the procedure to the individual patient's AF mechanism on that day, rather than doing an empiric lesion set. Which may partly explain the difference in the procedure and uh, fluoroscopy times. Yes. Um, all right. Yeah. Okay. So um, here, what I'm going to try and show you is that an individual technology makes no impact. But when you combine technologies and wipe out a number of those challenges, you can begin to make a clinical out outcome improvement. So in this study, we compared four groups of patients undergoing manual with or without contact force and robotic um, ablation with or without contact force. And what you can see, as we've experienced already, that it doesn't really make much difference. Whatever technology you use, if you have contact force sensing, then your fluoroscopy times tend to be lower because the physician has a greater confidence in where they're at in the patient's heart. However, this is very interesting, that if you add contact force to robotic uh, navigation, the combination of stability and knowing where your catheter is in contact seems to improve the outcome of the, plate, of the ablation. And that may be simply a, an effect of better durability of the pulmonary vein isolation or durability of the substrate ablation that you've added on during that procedure. But the point is, whatever procedure you do, combining technology seems to give an, an improved outcome. So, so far I've addressed the first paragraph that I think that we have uh, greatly improved catheter stability and catheter localization. We now know what the lesion sizes we are uh, delivering are because we now have catheter contact force. This challenge we still haven't addressed is knowing what the tissue is underneath that catheter and how big the lesion really needs to be. And <coughs> catheter ultrasound uh, may um, deliver that. MRI, better quality MRI may help us. 
The second and briefer part of my talk I want to address is how do we know if we're going to do something more than pulmonary vein isolation, what we need to ablate and where we need to ablate. Um, so this is a slide showing that my persistent AF um, ablation outcomes and you can see that the first time success is still only around 60% and that's not really changed over the last three years. I'm using a, at least a one year follow up so I'm giving a good, um, a decent follow up. And so even with all these technologies, I'm still not really doing any better than the groups in the STAR AF2 study were doing with pulmonary vein isolation alone. So we still clearly have a problem uh, in getting good outcomes for persistent AF ablation. What's the answer? Well, a number of um, companies and investigators are, in, uh, are looking at ways of improving AF mapping. And this is an example of omnipole mapping and the, this is one way of trying to address the fact that when you're trying to understand AF activation, unless you have a reference, it's difficult to know where everything else times in relation to the orig original reference electrogram. And with AF, where the uh, AF cycle length changes from beat to beat, it's very, very difficult to map only over any length of uh, distance because you, don't, you can't map uh, sequentially. So omnipole mapping attempts to address this by looking at relative directions and velocity vectors from uh, omnipoles, <coughs> with many of the omnipoles being their own reference. Another way of approaching this is to try and do simultaneous mapping. And this is the Abbott medical rotor mapping. <coughs> and what they do is they put in a basket into the left atrium, they then create a simultaneous map. They then address the issue that you collect a lot of far field data, including the ventricle, by subtracting the ventricular activation. Then they try and tag the atrial activation on the individual basket electrode unipoles, and then try and create a map to identify rotational activity. And then this is the output in the bottom right can corner showing what appears to be a rotor, which has then been colored and highlighted to try and show uh, where they think the rotor is. The approach then is to ablate that rotor and try and return the patient to sinus rhythm. Now, many groups and investigators have a real problem with this type of technology because the concept of ablating in the middle of the rotor and the rotor stopped, stopping doesn't seem to make electrophysiological sense. Most people would expect you to then have to anchor that rotor to a fixed anatomical location. Nevertheless, there is some research data that suggests that if you increase the uh, wavelength of the rotor, it can no longer continue. So there may be an explanation as to why ablating in the center of the rotor has some clinical impacts. However, investigators are split very much into whether this is helpful or not. And you can see on the left-hand side, a very fair uh, summary of the data actually produced by Abbott Medical themselves, showing that many investigators show very good outcomes, but a number of very important studies show that the outcomes from this approach are very poor indeed. Um, and I think that the challenge with this type of approach is that probably AF is not one single unifying mechanism. And if you obsess about one mechanism, i.e. rotors or CFEs or lines, you will fail to get a good outcome because not every patient is the same. Carto Finder is a, another new technology trying to address this problem, again using simultaneous mapping from basket arrays and then using multi-electrode catheters to try and create raw dynamic 4D maps to look at activation direction in real time. And on the left, you can see a focal activation emerging from the septum there, maybe from the right atrium. And on the right, we see a rotor within the right atrium appearing to rotate around a central focal point. So this type of technology may allow us to see more easily what we find challenging to see with limited um, contact catheters, either a PV catheter or a um, decapolar catheter. So in conclusion, I would say that the first and most important thing about ablation success is it's really dependent on correct, correct patient selection. You know if the patient's had AF for more than five years with very dilated atria and haven't been in sinus rhythm for the whole of that five years, 
there's a very low chance of them getting a good outcome because they'll have so much scarring, as Carlo implied earlier on, that the atria is so abnormal to start with, you're never going to get them back to sinus rhythm. A second element is having the correct technology, and uh, having something like cryoablation is a very easy way of producing a highly predictable outcome for the patient. The third important element is having the correct experience and having a, and that just doesn't relate to the operator themselves, but the whole team and the whole lab, knowing when the uh, ablation should and should not occur and how to deal with complications. And I would say at the moment, until we have a hard, a hard evidence of benefit of new approaches and technologies, then I think it's very reasonable to offer PVI alone. PVI alone, however, I think is very unlikely to ultimately prove the best solution to pers persistent AF, but at the moment we don't have a p better solution than that, and I think research and investigations are ongoing. Thank you very much for that uh, very nice um, overview of maybe what's coming up, what do you see uh, for the future. Um, let me just start with one question from my side or from one comment from my side. Um, don't you maybe think that our definition, and you mentioned that mechanisms <coughs> of uh, persistent AF maybe, mm. or are different compared to paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, but don't you think that um, the definition of persistent atrial fibrillation is more, um, more clinical, of course, it's a clinical definition based on timing and yeah. uh, clinical measures or clinical um, um, interventions. Um, don't you think that um, a group, maybe not a subgroup, but a group of persistent AF also shares the same mechanism as a PVI responder? Yeah. Whereas there's, of course, I sh I'm sure there's uh, a group of patients uh, in persistent atrial fibrillation, which is, by the way, still very ill-defined, um, of PVI non-responders. So therefore, we should maybe come up with more an elect EP definition on yeah. persistent atrial fibrillation. At least this is what, we, what is our uh, impression every day in the cath lab. We keep discussing it every day. Mm. So I would be interested in how you feel about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think at the moment, um, there's no doubt that we see patients who have so-called early persistent AF, you isolate the veins and they return to sinus rhythm. It's very compelling that the veins are the source or yeah. something near to the veins are the driver. Um, but we also know that there are patients who, who don't return to sinus rhythm and you have to cardiovert them. However, with the limitation with uh, convent or with RF experience so far, that the rate of permanent PVI was not 100%. Absolutely, but what I mean is during the acute procedure itself. Yeah. So that implies that there is something different about their atria that sustains the AF beyond the elimination of the pulmonary veins and the potential trigger. Now, whether that means that pulmonary vein isolation won't be as effective and something else in addition will be more effective, we don't know. But, you know, we definitely do separate out patients and at the moment I think the best we have in real practice is time. The time they've been in AF continuously for me is still the easiest applicable um, marker of what they're, how they're likely to behave when you're isolating the veins. And it is very tempting if you see the, if you see the veins isolate and you see the AF begin to organize. I find it almost impossible not to resist mapping that AF finding the source and ablating them to sinus rhythm. I just can't resist not putting them back to sinus rhythm if I know that I'm going to be doing a limited ablation. I, I fully agree. Of course, it is uh, appealing and it is um, something we want to really achieve and strive for to, to see termination. But on the other hand, termination does not, of course, mean uh, always uh, um, a long-term success. This yeah. we also, of course, know. Just coming back to the questions, and we asked um, regarding to your presentation, what area do you think development and improvement would most benefit patients from? A, more effective antiarrhythmic drugs, zero. More precise diagnostic tools, so better understand what's going on, 40%. And more uh, efficient ablation tools, 60%. And standardized ablation procedures, zero, other zero. So interesting. So at, at least audience uh, wants to have <coughs> better tools and better weapons. I think uh, uh, the talk about better tools, it's not completely correct. I think the, the, the idea is to change in the way. I'm very happy that the, uh, the group of the drugs is 0%. But uh, I think uh, 
the early stage of the ablation is play a role. Because, uh, I mean, if you are talking about persistent, we, we consider persistent the progression of the paroxysmal based on the fact that uh, there is a fibrotic process coming up that could be, let's say, in the measure of the patient is progressing in the same way. So maybe if the rotor are related on the, uh, on the fibrosis process, you will always find the rotor in the same region related with innervation. I mean, the point is that the message to come is not only to have a better tools, but the people have to understand that you have to be as early as possible because uh, we saw that the success of the ablation, it's always related on the timing of the, of the AFib. So the point that uh, um, I don't think we should concentrate on better tools at the moment. I think the, 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 the community has to understand that we have to move on the early stage of the ablation. Because the tools that we have, they are not so bad, honestly. We, we do perform, I mean, we, we can obtain a PVI isolation. We can obtain a stable PVI isolation. They are safe tools. Uh, I think uh, um, in a high, I mean, you know, in a high flow expert lab, uh, you can use whatever you want. But today there are also tools that are quite uh, uh, simple and safe that could be applied in the small experience center. So maybe we can start to treat an, uh, uh, a large uh, amount of patient to isolate the vein. Because anyway, the vein, it's, uh, it's remained the first trigger. And, and, and in the other hand, I think uh, we, we spend so much time for researching tools and uh, better tools and less time in physiopathology. I mean, if we want to classify the AFI, we should go back and maybe on the, on the physiopathology point of view. So get your point in Brussels. <laughs> you want to early ablate the patients. You don't want them to progress into fibrotic no, stages no, we, and of course, catch them of early course. up during we, the we, we do perform per, of persistent, disease. like you yeah, say. We yeah. like also to ablate with organized AFI. We're <coughs> looking for the point of termination. It's very attractive. Uh, but the point that uh, we try to, to train our fellow to be as soon as possible uh, on, the, on the PVI isolation. But still, at least, um, just coming back into the bigger categories, I think on you also touched uh, the patient selection and uh, potentially indications for um, cancer ablation and persistent atrial ablation as well. Um, I think we uh, really, or we, we should really better understand which patient would benefit from an ablation procedure. So what, from your point of view, what part, I mean, you mentioned uh, um, invasive mapping tools, what about non-invasive mapping tools? What is your point on that? So, uh, look, I, I think you kind of made a very important point that early access is really important. Patient awareness, referring clinician awareness is, I think, uh, I agree, the number one thing that's going to have an early impact on our outcomes. In terms of the uh, mapping tools and other technologies, um, I was involved in the first non-contact mapping studies many years ago. We mapped AF. They produced very similar maps to the maps we see today with body surface mapping. And we found that ablation of those targets made, we made no difference to the AF mechanism. So I'm yet to be convinced that body surface mapping is going to give us any answers. Um, I think what the audience is really hooked onto is the fact that we have an epidemic there. And we just do not have the luxury and the time to spend eight hours doing Absolutely. AF ablation procedures. And we don't have the luxury of keeping this procedure in really big centers like uh, Brussels and, and uh, the Heart Center in London. And while it infuriates me, because it's undermining my entire skill and training, cryoablation means that it's possible for patients to get a much more predictable procedure, whoever does it, you don't need to have spent 20 years doing an AF ablation to Absolutely. produce a good cryoablation. So that's a bit irritating for me, but I, I've got to learn to live with it. And I think industry has to make this, the whole thing more cost effective for patients. But I still think that better diagnostic tools to understand the mechanism, if we can find a way of showing what the AF mechanism is, hitting it in one burn and returning that patient to sinus rhythm and that lesions remaining intact, then I think that would be a big step forward, yeah. but I think it's still a long way off. No, 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 I, I completely agree. The point is that uh, um, the, the, we are challenged with the progressive arrhythmias where we are not used. <coughs> I mean, the point that, you know, uh, uh, a conventional uh, EP is based on arrhythmias that you can treat once in 1% twice and then it's done. You're absolutely right. You get it today, <laughs> you don't know that something yeah, else absolutely. won't come tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. The, the point is that, uh, sorry, uh, I, I the, the point is that uh, 
you can only be sure about your selection after you isolate the vein. So that's still our challenge because yeah. all selection we are made, they can be confirmed only if you isolate the pulmonary vein. Yes. So I think we agree, permanent PVI, also in persistent atrial fibrillation is um, the cornerstone and is, that we, are, we all agree with the guideline. Yeah. Um, I just want to uh, bring up a question from the audience. And the audience was asking, um, is there still a role for surgical ablation procedures for persistent AFib patients? So you mentioned your Brussels approach. Mm -hmm. And maybe you yeah, shortly uh, comment again on that. No, so actually we, we do perform, a, um, we, we have a, a good team, a hard team with a good surgeons that we do perform a hybrid procedure. Actually, we still challenge with the patient that they was left in AFib without any uh, control. So they come with a very large atrium. We do believe that their PVI will not be enough because the progress of the fibrotic, <coughs> uh, uh, it's too far. Uh, I think we have a nice result. Of course, it's a procedure that should not be considered uh, quite easy. I mean, the patient should be uh, prepared, and, uh, um, and it's a procedure that is uh, it's, uh, in, in a solid, only specific center. But I still, there is a lot of space for a surgical because the patient, they're still keeping AFib and anticoagulation without treat them. So I remain skeptical, but open-minded. Um, <laughs> I think that the That's surgeons um, now, given the location and contact force technologies, it's difficult to understand what the surgeons can do in terms of lesion integrity that we can't achieve via a catheter, other than access the epicardial surface and modify the autonomic ganglia. Um, I, you know, I see surgical patients come back with PV reconnection, so they're not immune to it. So, and I think that STAR F2, has, uh, uh, as have many other multicenter trials, taught us an important lesson that until you test it in a randomized trial, you really don't know what the answer is. All of us were convinced no, no, no. that I, we need to do I, more I than PVI. Agree. I mean, uh, the, we perform actually is hybrid procedure. So we check from endovascular with the catheter what the surgeon does. And I agree <coughs> with you, there are reconnection, uh, there are still lesions that are not progressing the way that we want. Um, I think there is a, a different level of denervation. I mean, we, we have studied it, but I think there is space for that because uh, uh, there are some uh, uh, improvements. But I hope, you know, the, the, the hope is that this patient will not exist anymore. <laughs> yeah, well, you're, you're, giving the, you're giving the surgeons the patients you don't want to treat yourself. Don't you? No, the point is that uh, it's a patient that they went too far. I mean, yeah. Yeah, but I think it's good. Uh, we, I mean, it should be the goal to avoid a surgeon, but yeah. of course, in some situations, um, it could be helpful, but I, I'm with you that uh, I would be also be a little more on the skeptical side. But there's another question from Dr. Bruvers, and he's asking um, you, what substrate do you choose to ablate in the second procedure in patients with persistent AFib when the first PVI has been successful? So permanent setting, permanent PVI, what do you do in the second procedure? Um, so what I try to do is to map the atrial fibrillation. So I'll put the pulmonary vein catheter into the uh, appendage, I'll put the decapolar catheter into the CS, and I'll try and see patterns within the activation that will steer me to where the AF drivers may be. And we know that anatomically there are a limited number of sites that tend to be vulnerable to this. You know, the ridge between the appendage and the left pulmonary vein, um, the septum, sometimes the roof. And I'll try and specifically the map the AF, it's at all possible. Clearly in patients who've had long-standing AF with very disorganized patterns, that's simply not feasible. And let me ask more specifically, then you do ablate these regions in a point fashion or a focal fashion, or do you just do a, a pretty big lesion in that area, or do you do a <coughs> connecting lines? Do you also take the maybe the bipolar voltages mi in, into your consideration yeah. to, to address maybe the so-called low voltage areas? So I don't take in low voltage areas, but what you do, what you can see when you're doing this sort of mapping is that you will have perhaps two distinct patterns. The first is um, focal, where your mapping catheter gets earlier and earlier, the, closer, the further away it gets from the earliest PV electrode, and then begins to get later again. And you know that around that area, there must be something that's either micro reentry or rotor or focal, whatever you'd like to call it that is driving that region. And then I'll ablate and do a, a relatively limited um, cluster of ablations around that uh, location. And if there's no electrogram there, that doesn't mean I won't ablate there, because you often see endocardial scar and you ablate on it and you find that it terminates because there's something hiding 
behind that scar that you, you couldn't see on the electrogram, as long as the activation suggests it's emerging from that location. Mm -hmm. And then the second one is a sort of more organized pseudo macro reentry where I may do a, be drawn into doing a line, um, but I try and resist it if I possibly can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what we do in Frankfurt, I mean, we always also for, uh, I mean, exposed to this question. We try to address the, the substrate. So we do a careful map, a, low, a voltage map, mm. and try to do smart lines combining uh, and addressing um, yeah. the, the, these low voltage areas. And then we really want to go for an EP endpoint with bidirectional block. Of course, knowing that um, lines through healthy tissue uh, are very, very difficult to permanently block. Okay, another question from the audience. And um, for more complex ablation procedures to, comp to PVI only, are there differences in the post-procedural care or duration of the hospital stay? So, um, what well, actually, um, if uh, in our strategy, when you perform a PVI ablation with a cryo balloon in a persistent, of course, the, the hospital stay is very short. I know that uh, in UK they even perform in a day hospital for administrative reason. We don't do that, but I believe it's possible. And uh, I don't do because it's not interesting for us. Um, the point is that uh, um, for sure, and, uh, and uh, the patient is can, uh, can leave the hospital quite easy, can, uh, can be back on his normal life quite easy. I think it's a very good uh, uh, advantage. What about the surgical patients? Do they have to stay longer? Um no, for a, for a surgical patient, we do not perform only PVI. I mean, mm. when you have a surgical patient, actually the approach on the long-standing AFib is with a, a PVI, a posterior box, and a, based on the chest core, uh, the occlusion of the appendage. Uh, they have to stay, no, it's actually up to a week. Okay. Carla, let me ask uh, also one other question regarding the post-ablation process. Do you keep your patients on antiarrhythmic drugs to bridge them over the blanking time? Would does it affect your decision to continue or discontinue oral anticoagulation? But you know, we, um, it, it depends on the patient. For example, uh, if we have patient with hypertension and uh, maybe the hypertension is treated with a beta blocker, we do not add anything else. But if the patient is uh, free of drugs before the ablation, because we have also young people, for example, we try to keep them free of drugs also post ablation to understand because we saw that uh, uh, it's, uh, it could be predictable. So if I uh, can read the timings correctly, I think we just have 10 seconds less. So therefore, um, I think we uh, have to come to an end. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward. We are looking forward to host another webinar, maybe on a different topic. Thank you very much.